Hello, everyone. My name is Nancy Donovan, and I am the Events Specialist at the College of Business Administration at Loyola Marymount University. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our Grosh Lecture Series. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few general webinar guidelines. Please type your question in the Q&A window. These questions will be moderated after the presentation. Use the chat window to post your comments or insights. And a friendly reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be available after the presentation. And with that, I'd like to introduce our Associate Dean and Dreyer Chair in Accounting Ethics, Larry Calvers, who will kick us off. Thanks, Nancy, and good evening. On behalf of the College of Business Administration, our Dean, Dale Smith, and the Department of Accounting, I want to welcome all of you to the Paul A. Grouch Lecture Series. The Paul A. Grouch Professorship, currently held by Dr. Rosemary Kim, was made possible by many LMU accounting alumni who funded the professorship in honor of Paul A. Grouch, who was a professor of accounting from 1952 to 1984. I'm really delighted to welcome our speaker tonight, Ash Noah, who's VP and Managing Director of Learning, Education and Development at the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. Not to steal his thunder or his full introduction, Ash will talk about technology and its impact on the future of accounting and finance. This is an incredibly timely and important topic, and I'm looking forward to hearing what Ash has to say. So thanks again for being here, and I'd now like to turn it over to Dr. Kim to give a full introduction for tonight's speaker, Ash Noah. Thank you, Dr. Calvers. I would like to say thank you so much for your support as the Associate Dean, and also thank you to Dean Dale Smith for all your support. I also want to express my gratitude to Nancy, Natalie, Nola, and Roberta, who have all been instrumental in making this event happen. And special shout out to all my special colleagues for encouraging your wonderful students to attend today. And lastly, I want to thank the Paul A. Grosh supporters because this event would not be possible without your support. And now a little background about our distinguished speaker, Mr. Ash Noah. Um, Ash Noah has an amazing background and we are truly fortunate to have him as our Grosh speaker today. Um, as Dr. Kalbers mentioned, he is the Vice President and Managing Director of Learning, Education, and Development at the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. In this position, he leads the research, examinations, and learning product development for the Management Accounting Unit. He works closely with CFOs and business finance leaders globally, identifying trends and are the factors that are impacting practitioners, businesses, and the profession in order to ensure that, um, that the association's finance competency framework, exams, and all the learning solutions are effective in producing uh, prepared, effective business leaders in finance and accounting. And Ash was formerly the CFO of International Unit of TNT. It is a global express logistics provider, and he led finance transformation in teams across 45 countries. He is truly a global uh, perspective, uh, knowledgeable person, and we are so lucky to have him today. He is a chartered global management accountant. He holds a CPA license, and he's a fellow of the Chartered Institute and Management Accountants and a member of the American Institute of CPAs. In his very limited free time, Ash has a passion for flying and is an avid aviator. We are so fortunate to have him today. Thank you so much once again. And Ash, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Rosemary. What a delight it is to be joining you all and spending this uh, hour with you. Uh, I honestly, I was saying before, I am energized by you all, uh, by your energy, your enthusiasm, your, your um, belief in the future and uh, your belief in the future of accounting and finance. Um, and, and the fact that you're all here is a testament to your commitment. So I appreciate that and I really I'm thankful to um, LMU to, to give me this opportunity uh, to be speaking to you and to share some of the experiences and to share what lies ahead 
Um, so I um, just want to confirm, Rosemary, you can see my screen and yes. It's... Okay, fantastic. So um, I, I am a former practitioner and as a practitioner, whoops. Is that good now? Yes. I suddenly lost my screen, so I just want You're to... good. Yeah, so as, as a pr practitioner, uh, what I have done is transform myself from being a practitioner to come into education. And that in itself happened uh, by accident, but I am so glad that I've been given this opportunity to shape some of the future professionals that are going to come through our programs. Uh, I'm a former CFO, as you heard, and I have never seen the amount of changes that are taking places that, that are taking place now. Um, I've been through, uh, I was actually in, in Dubai and Bahrain through the Gulf War and, and so saw through the Gulf War crisis. I was in the US in 08, saw through the 08 crisis. Uh, and now the pandemic, uh, th this has been a massive humanitarian and an economic crisis. And the impact of this has been epic. Um, and, and the proportions of impact on our social, political and economic landscape are huge. But I really, really think these are life changing times. These are really exciting times. And these are times when those of us who can make a difference are going to make a difference. And so the, uh, the shifting and the acceleration in these shifts are massive and, and I just want to touch at a very high level some of these shifts. Uh, trust being a big issue to address and, and people are looking to establishments and t people are looking to professions that they can trust. And the accounting and finance professions, I believe, are one of those where in times such as these, where there's a radical disruption on multiple fronts, we are uh, a, a tower, we are a solid foundation, and these disruptions are not new to us. Um, we have come through several of these and the profession continues to strengthen. And as a profession, I believe we were prepared to address uh, a lot of these challenges that we face today. But the, this disruption is not going to end with the pandemic. Uh, it has been accelerating and it will continue to accelerate. Um, we will face a future of continuous disruption and, and we will just go from one normal to another normal and it'll be a series of next normals. And the acceleration in this pace of change is, is only getting faster. Um, accountants and finance will continue to play a, a, a pretty significant role um, in the future as it unfolds in leading our organizations, guiding businesses, uh, providing services that we provide. And also with that comes a shift in some of the skills that we need. But in, in this web of change, I think there's a massive opportunity uh, for us finance professionals, for us accounting professionals to reimagine what it, what it can be like. And that is one of my roles in my job, that I reimagine the future of accounting and finance and, and I need to prepare the future candidates who come through our qualification in order to do that. And, and hopefully some of what I shared today uh, will really um, give you some insights, but it will also prepare you for some of the things that you might be facing. Uh, and really, um, the, the resilience that we have as a profession and the resilience that you will develop and as you go through your program, it will really enable you to leverage disruption. And, and you, will not, you will see opportunities and you'll see areas that you can really capitalize on and to really grow yourself individually as a professional. Uh, the opportunities are for the profession to redefine itself. Uh, as as a whole for leaders who lead teams to prepare their teams for the future but then as individuals for us really to uh, be focused on our skills and competencies so 
trust is a trust as i said is a big thing but there are several other things that are emerging supply chain is on everybody's mind everybody's talking and understands supply chain the pressures on supply chain um the the technological changes are massive and and i'll focus on some of that as we go in and technology really impacts the business models how business is done what are the goods and services that the consumers consume and how they consume it how do we serve our customers in new and different ways using technology is what the business model is all about and and business models are being disrupted because of technology and the way technology can be leveraged to serve the customer in different ways and we've seen that even through the pandemic how the touchless transactions and uh, curbside deliveries and drive through banking and and all of these things have grown exponentially um remote work has become norm uh, the acceleration in remote work has been the most exciting in terms of things that we never thought we could do remotely we are doing remotely now and and that's going to fundamentally change the structure of our working day it's going to change the structure of our working week it's going to change the uh, operational model for how we employ uh, staff and how we um uh, exercise control over the working environment um the well-being of staff has become paramount and in all of this we have cybersecurity issues because we are all working remotely through um stacks and stacks of servers and firewalls and access and uh in in the midst of all this uh, cybercrime continues to increase and and that's another shift we need to be dealing with and latest was cop 26 in edinburgh which is going to fundamentally redefine our profession because not only are we going to be responsible for and we need to position ourselves for that future uh as we are responsible for a true and fair view of the financial um uh, the financial view and the the actual accounts we will also have to be looking at a true and fair view of the non-financials as the ISSB which has just been launched the international sustainability standards board is equivalent to all the accounting standards that have been released before through IFRS and obviously FASB here in the US but this sustainable sustainability standards will have to be uh, reported and audited and the information that is provided to the investors in terms of a true and fair view of the non-financials are going to become as critical as the financials and there's a whole ecosystem that's going to come about uh which we are trying to position our profession as the one that can be relied upon to provide that reporting the measurement and the disclosure for the non-financials uh in terms of some of the intangibles that I want to talk about as well so massive shifts uh in the environment and so um big big impacts on uh the the office of the CFO big impacts on accounting and finance that we need to be aware of as we go forward so bringing that back now to ground level <laughs> what is the role of accounting and finance well we've always reported financial information and non-financial information we know how to collate and curate those reports we know all the various sources of information we we go to those sources of information whether it's transactional through financial transactions or whether it's other KPIs that are reported which are non-financial and uh, they are key performance indicators that help the business to get insights we communicate those insights with influence and impact and and so that part about being able to effectively communicate influence the decision making collaborate with all the other functions within that enterprise because finance really is almost like a hub and there are many spokes connected to the outer wheel of the business and finance is almost the glue that holds all this together because everything is expressed and translated in terms of financials and decisions are made with regard to the financial outcomes and and so um the one of the key things that finance is is 
it is at the center of activity. We're almost sitting right up front and center, and we have a wide view of the end-to-end -end business processes, the wide view of the end-to-end -end processes that make us money and that we, we report the costs and we are in control of the environment that that actually reports the costs and revenues and profits and and the reason i'm setting this up is because i'm, I'm giving that as a baseline because those things are changing and i'll talk about some of those changes so as we consider the role of finance and accounting um, and um, i want to talk about the skills required so it's always been that we need some technical skills uh, and these technical skills are very much technical in terms of what accounting and finance professionals need to know accounting standards compliance with policies procedures um, and and so there is this um, role that finance plays in terms of a governance um, to the business and and we provide that governance and oversight and the other side of it is the business guidance and we need some business skills commercial skills we need skills around strategy we need skills around understanding our business model and making commercial decisions that ensures that we maintain competitive advantage and and so that those are the two broad skill set the technical skill sets and then the business skills uh, that are further which which we need to develop as we grow into our career and move up the the ladder in in the financial organization now what is changing there is that as we go forward, the the technical aspects of the information, and, and here's where my aviation, my love for aviation comes in, and you'll see some parallels here, is that um, we play the role of a navigator, and the navigator provides key information. They do exactly that. They collate the information from various systems that they are overseeing. They make sure that the plane's getting to its destination safely, avoiding terrain at the right away points in terms of meeting the budgets, meeting the targets. We've got adequate fuel. We make sure we don't run out of cash and we don't crash that plane. So we take the plane safely to the destination. Uh, we are in, the navigator is in the back seat and the pilot and co-pilot are flying the plane. There are no controls that the navigator has. So there are no inputs that the navigator makes other than communicating very clearly information that the pilot and co-pilot needs to act upon. Now, what happened in the cockpit was cockpit automation and technology. And now, today, we do not need a navigator in the cockpit. And what the navigator needed to do was learn, they had to learn to fly the plane. And so they became the co-pilots. And that's, that's kind of the transition at a very high level that we are looking at that instead of just providing information about the PNL and variances and performance against budget and performance against last year and how things are tracking and how things are trending, we actually need to transition ourselves to be able to make business decisions. So we're moving from decision support to actual decision making. So we're moving towards execution and we're moving towards co-creation of value. Now, what that then does is it requires us to gain additional skills around technology and automation and around social skills. So it, these are skills that were always required. We've always talked about those soft skills, the skills that enable us to collaborate and communicate and effectively co-create value. But the imperative, as our role changes to being more of a co-pilot and being more engaged with the business, these social skills are becoming more and more important. So what, you, what, what we end up with is that human element and those social skills being really dialed up. So that is kind of the big shift in change in the nature of our role just from being an advisor, a trusted business advisor, an advisor that had the right information at the right time uh, that was given to the business to enable them to fly that business safely to destination, now requires us to be actually engaging with the business. So 
think about the navigator as the um, the person that governed the flight, made sure waypoints were uh, accurately navigated to, made sure we avoided turbulence terrain, uh, made sure the systems were in compliance, etc. Uh, and now we actually ha are having to make inputs to the controls instead of saying, uh, Captain, you need to turn two degrees to the left because winds have changed. Uh, we actually make the input as the co-pilot. And, and that requires a significant shift in the way that we interact with the business. And that really uh, kind of sums up how this role is changing. Now, not only is the role changing, the, the shape of the organization structure, which was a typical triangle, a hierarchical triangle, is changing because of technology. And that technology is what we are addressing today. You know, these shifts that are being caused by technology are fundamentally affecting how our core accounting operations get done. So when you look at the procure to pay, the order to cash, the hire to retire, and record to report type of processes uh, are being automated. They're being automated by robotic process automation, the adoption of the cloud, and in-memory computing are really making a lot of these transactional processes very, very quick. And so when you look at the proportion of the workforce that is focused on core accounting operations, it will reduce to between 10 and 20% of the overall workforce. So you have between 10 and 20% of the workforce here, you have about 10% of the workforce as the leaders on top who are really focused on value creation, co-creating value on that right-hand side in the previous slide that you saw. Uh, and that middle band, it continues to expand. And the people, you'll have 80% of a organization staff really focused on subject matter expertise, such as treasury, tax, controllership, uh, mergers and acquisitions, or in uh, financial planning and analytics, uh, or decision support. And so that business guidance function continues to grow and there's more and more and the maximum number of people required in that decision, decision support, that co-piloting role, really engaging with the business, analyzing the business and making uh, key decisions to help create value. And, and so that triangle is changing more into a diamond and the, the middle continues to expand and, and um, you, you can see how um, the type of um, more and more, the, the t kind of people that are required, the type of people that are required uh, are those that can uh, live and breathe technology, be able to um, consume data, ingest data, uh, extract load and transform data and drive that data to decision process. And so what we're also seeing is this emergence of a um, kind of person that's a problem solver. And these teams are solving business problems using analytics. Uh, they, they're solving business issues, business problems, and there's this emerging need for that type of skill set. So as, as we go towards those skill sets, um, th there are new tool sets. Those tool sets are really determined by technology, um, leading to skill sets, and these are skills that you apply at the workplace. Um, I want to focus a, a, a on some mindsets today and really give you that view of what kind of mindsets should we be aiming at. And I want to talk about the agile man, mindset, uh, and I'll talk about agile methodology. And this is something that we really need to, as finance professionals, engage in and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then as we go up the value chain, at the highest, you see the value creation mindset that we should be all about um, moving from the back office to the front office, creating value. Um, the opportunity to create value is unprecedented. Um, and that is through solving business problems, having an analytical mindset, and really engaging with technology and automation. So I'll, I'll talk about these mindsets in the next five or 10 minutes. So having this agile mindset, as accounting professionals, 
uh, we are very focused on a logical sequential methodology of delivering end-to-end -end, start with the transaction end with the reporting controls compliance and it's a very linear process which requires discipline we don't abandon that but we also learn an agile mindset which is in this world of technology and transformation we need to be able to deliver projects and deliver transformation through an agile methodology and really this is about breaking down problems into manageable chunks testing and learning to create progress and so we accelerate decision making through the agile methodology we expose challenges quickly as we do test and learn and test and learn and and uh, rinse and repeat and then we in this process also develop high performing teams and removing silos so so these agile teams not just consist of finance and accounting but are from operations from sales from marketing depending on what you're addressing and what you're transforming and the agile methodology really creates efficiencies so it, it is this a mindset which is around a test and learn and implement uh, so that we can deliver transformation projects more quickly let me give you a quick example of what a non-agile process versus an agile process looks like four years to deliver a car four years to deliver something that the customer is finally happy with starting off with component parts the wheels the chassis the body and finally a moving vehicle uh, and and that that process is a linear logical sequential process as opposed to an agile process which delivers something to the customer on day one or year one where the customer can actually move the customer is able to start moving and you build upon that solution until you end up with a convertible which the customer is much happier with and and so that agile process requires a different mindset and agile methodology is something we should be getting familiar with our surveys show that there are agile companies and they analyze opportunities and are quick to market uh, they're able to measure intangibles i'll talk about intangibles in a few slides and they really um, change the way they report from historical and um, analytics that's about why did something happen rather than really giving forward-looking analysis of what should be done predictive and prescriptive an analytics rather than just diagnostic an analytics and and so these are some of the attributes that emerge if one uh, gets a, a and, and embraces an agile mindset an automation mindset is about automating anything that is repeatable anything that is rule-based anything that is predictable so rule-based repeatable predictable automatable and so as you see there's more automation opportunities uh, in the general accounting operations what we now starting to call the finance factory and and significant automation benefits can be achieved through robotic automation and through re-engineering your processes and that um, automation mindset using technology leveraging technology is extremely important and I know the younger generation the Gen Z's and and uh, the, the, these generations that are coming through such as yourselves are digital natives and you're always looking at that opportunity how can I do this through technology and that's a mindset that's absolutely critical the analytical mindset is another mindset that we need to develop within finance um, gone are the days where we could use accounting data and finance data to partner with the business. The sources of data and the amount of data that is available in the business, in all the other parts of the business, whether it's sales and marketing or whether it's um, procurement or operations or HR, um, sales and marketing, the, they, these are massive sources of data which need, need to be analyzed and the value that can be created through insights in those data sources and joining the end-to-end -end, um, value creation story through data is tremendous and so really being able to 
handle data, B, not become data engineers and data scientists, but, but know enough of data engineering and data science that we can actually uh, participate in data analytics and really create value. Uh, this is a problem solving mindset, very similar to agile, but this is design thinking. And design thinking is about really providing this a mindset that is about problem solving. It's evaluating options. It's getting involved, deep, deep involvement uh, in understanding the issue and uh, deciding and then delivering a solution. So finance are not just um, those that identify the problem and move on, but they find the solution and then they also implement the solution. So. Um, improving your forecasts, uh, improving error rates, improving the accuracy of your estimates, uh, improving the um, uh, payment of invoices to suppliers. Um, these, these are all many challenges that each organization's face and, and this is where problem solving mindset through design thinking really helps in prototyping solutions and implementing solutions. So this is another mindset. Then I wanna talk about this value creation mindset. And that was at the very top. And that, what that is about is really moving from business partnering to value partnering. Um, the new partnering is value partnering because business partnering used to be, let me give you your reports, let me show you your variances, let me explain why these variances happen uh, all around diagnostics and giving insights for future decision making. All of that is being automated. Machines are going to collate information, curate the reports and provide the insights. And what we need to then do is go further up the value chain um, and really engage with the business as that co-pilot and really executing decisions, um, investing in the right areas, enabling business guidance uh, rather than just governance. And, and so how do I create value? How do I add value? What is it that I am? I did today that added value. That is the kind of mindset that finance needs to be living and breathing. And and as as I bring this to a close, I want to talk about a couple of other things. And and one of this is intangibles. When one looks at the net assets in a balance sheet and compares that to the market cap, which is the uh, representative of enterprise value you find that today there's a 90% gap. Um, if you look at the p and balance, balance sheet of Tesla and you look at their valuation, it doesn't equate. Um, for Tesla, it would be maybe 95%. I've not done the numbers, but I wouldn't be surprised if 95% of the value is in the future and is based on intangibles. And those intangibles are not in the balance sheet. I'm not talking about goodwill. I'm talking about intangibles like human capital social relationship capital, relationships with customers and supplier, the ability to execute. These are intangibles within an organization which gives them the social license to operate, which gives them the ability to create value in the future and, and really um, uh, go beyond the, the balance sheet and the P&L. So the imperative, if we want to create value, we have to move beyond the P&L and balance sheet. How do we do that? So I wanna uh, just quickly talk about the business model. Uh, and the business model is not just about the cost and revenue, it's where we live and breathe, where accountants and finance people live and breathe. But value is created when finance and the finance professionals and accountants will engage in understanding the customer value proposition. Why does the customer buy what we sell? Why does the customer consume what we provide as a service? How can we serve the customer in different ways, in new ways? How can we create new products? How can we really drive the customer to come to our offering rather than a competitor's offering? That is the fundamental, that, that's at the very top. And then how do we enable the resources and relationships that really drive the enterprise? So. Um, yes, we engage in investor relations to attract investor funds, but then there are supplier customer relationships and other relationships with stakeholders that, that finance and accounting needs to be engaged in. The processes that convert the raw, materi raw materials into finished products, inputs into services. 
we need to be engaged in those processes. We need to be engaged in the structure, scale and culture, enabling a culture of innovation, enabling a culture of disruption, uh, enabling a culture where we can scale up very quickly and also really engage in strategy. These are the areas where we will create that 90% of the value and then creating uh, through technology, creating a digital ecosystem that allows the enterprise to serve the customers in new ways, to interact with its external stakeholders in new ways, um, to come up with amazing products like, um, you know, platform as a service, um, which software companies are doing. And now Volvo Trucks is providing trucks as a service in terms of uptime. You buy uptime, you don't buy trucks. You buy the time when a vehicle is on the road and that's what you're paying for. So, so these type of offerings, these type of customer value propositions are innovative using technology and finance is right at the center of it, enabling that innovation and driving that value creation. So these are the kind of um, value delivery that finance needs to be engaged in um, and, and go out of the, the box of cost and revenues and, and go to these other dimensions of the business model and engage as that co-pilot, really uh, driving decision making in strategy, in culture, in processes, in relationships and uh, customer value, uh, in customer value proposition. Um, this is uh, another expression uh, of the operating model as we go forward, which really recognizes the chief financial officer as the chief value architect um, who is driving value through a base of intelligent finance operations, having this analytics hub that is ingesting data, not just within the enterprise, but outside of the enterprise, the data sets that are available, whether it's demographics or traffic um, or um, the, the data is around whether, you know, the, the number of data sets that are available, which if it can be incorporated, ingested and uh, connected with enterprise data, the insights that you can get and the value that you can drive through that center for value optimization is um, limitless. And, and at the same time, continuing as that corporate governance, uh, the, 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 the function that provides safety, security, um, and compliance and controls, uh, and, and being the guard of the enterprise and on the other side, really enhancing that strategic value partnering and, and um, those two pillars really um, dictating how finance positions itself, enabling finance to position itself as that value architect. And, and I wanna finish with that because that really is where uh, the finance and accounting function is moving to. Uh, and that is um, the, the sum and substance of these shifts in skills, the shifts in mindsets, uh, and really how technology is what is driving the intelligent finance operations. Technology is what is driving the analytics and it's technology that will enable us to engage in that business model in order to drive value. So that's that's the end of my talk. Um, I'm hoping there are lots of questions and that we're gonna run out of time uh, answering this question. So um, Rosemary, over to you and uh, let's see how we can um, address some of the questions that have come up. Okay, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I think our students who are diligently taking notes have so much that they've written, I'm sure. Um, I found the information to be so helpful, even for me. And I know that we all took away some really valuable information. So thank you very much. Um, one of the um, questions that I wanted to, uh, please be patient. Um, there are a lot of questions coming in, first of all. And so if I don't get to your question right away, that does not mean I skipped your question. It just means I'm sifting through the uh, questions as they are um, showing up. So uh, one of the first questions I believe came up um, as you were discussing uh, the agile methodology. And the question is, do businesses, do business processes, systems, 
or technologies need to be updated and modified uh, in order for businesses to be more successful within this new structure of agile methodology of doing business? Really, really great question that combines two very key things, technology, the transformation, and the agile mindset, which is required to embrace this. Um, so one of the things that companies need to change, and you're absolutely right, they need to change their processes and they need to change their systems. Uh, a lot of companies are still operating in the 20th century and in the 20th century model of the enterprise resource planning and the enterprise reporting, uh, the, the way we invoiced the customers, the way we paid our suppliers. Um, many organizations are still in 20th century on-premise type systems. Uh, and and the, the big leap and the big transformation that needs to happen is that the, the modern providers of enterprise resource planning and accounting and enterprise performance management systems are that they've moved to the cloud. So from premises to the cloud, being on the cloud fundamentally changes how your processes work. And so your legacy processes were based on technology. And, and the way it worked in the past was, you had a process designed, you would bring technology in, and the technology would have to replicate your process. What, what is happening today is that the vendors of ERP and these general ledgers and packages, they have come in with best practices on how a process should work, and they're leveraging automation and they're leveraging technology to the hilt. And so what companies need to do is re-engineer the legacy processes and not make technology fit the process, but make their processes fit the technology. And that's when you get the maximum benefit for the investment you're making in those systems, in the cloud uh, technologies, and enabling uh, the, the core to be automated, enabling uh, a common data set across your enterprise, enabling the robotics to be able to automate a lot of those processes. So it is fundamental that you make that shift to the 21st century way of doing accounting, running your processes and, and re-engineering your legacy processes in the way all the fundamental processes, record to report, procure to pay, order to cash, uh, hire to retire, all these processes need to be re-engineered to take advantage of machine learning, of AI, uh, and of the automation. Thank you very much. And um, within the topic of agile mindset, this is a very popular topic, seeing all the thread of questions. Um, another student asks, for those 18% of companies that do not have an agile mindset from the survey you showed earlier, what are some first steps that those companies can take to catch up with their competitors who do have an agile mindset? Right, so, so what this slide was showing is that when we asked the question, how many of you are able to measure your intangibles? How many of you are able to put a value to human capital? Uh, how many of you are able to translate staff retention into a value or customer retention into value. Uh, and what, what we found was the agile leaders, 49% uh, of those that said they were agile measured those intangibles, were able to provide conversions to value of customer retention, staff retention, customer churn, cost of customer churn, cost of staff turnover, uh, and, and, and were much more um, uh, able to report, measure, and change, and, and in the non-agile, 18%. So, so what that is really showing is how um, those leaders that had adopted the agile methodology were advanced in their digital transformation, were able to quickly respond to changing um, marketplace, were able to analyze opportunities that came up more quickly, and could accelerate their products and services to go to the market. Um, and, and so the non-agile were still in early stages of their digital transformation uh, and had, had a very linear sequential 
methodology to achieve that transformation and it would take them a lot longer to transform their function and and therefore were, were slower in terms of being able to do uh, these um, specific attributes that we were trying to measure. I hope that explains the difference between those that were more digitally advanced because of adopting an agile methodology and those that were still trying to digitize and trying to implement new systems and trying to implement these new um, um, capabilities that technology mm -hmm. was offering. And also keeping in mind that you can't just say all of a sudden we're going to be agile today. It's going to take the mindset and then the execution. So your right. research is probably showing some that may be in transition, but the results aren't there yet or something. So. Yeah. So uh, what we're seeing is we used to have a pretty standard distribution of those that were laggards, those that were really uh, advanced, and then the big middle in, in, in the center. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that standard distribution has suddenly, you know, take the two ends and stretch it. And, and there's a long um, um, co continuum of organizations who are still in the old 20th century and those that are bleeding edge. Mm -hmm. and, and so that, that curve has flattened and ha has stretched. And so uh, the, the population is not a very standard distribution at the moment. And that's one of the challenges when we're trying to address the skills of the future. Uh, but if you just purely focus on that, you're only addressing a very small population. So we've got to consider those that are still in, on the journey and take our time in, in, in terms of uh, moving everybody uh, along that continuum towards, um, towards the 21st century. Thank you. And uh, looking at our future, we have a bunch of students here who are dying to know what can they do as college students now um, to start uh, this idea of exercising agile mindset? Is there something they can do now? You, you, can, um, you can take a course on, a very basic course on agile and, and get familiar with the agile manif manifesto, get familiar with the agile methodology uh, and, and really start to understand how, how can you actually implement agile um, and, and look for opportunities, how you can use agile uh, within um, within your environment. Um, maybe it's how you uh, study. How can you use the Agile methodology in um, testing and learning uh, and uh, testing and learning how you score and, and changing that. So I, I think there's some fun things you can do with, uh, with the Agile methodology, but there's this, you know, a six hour course uh, that you might be able to find. Just spend that time, get familiar with design thinking and agile methodology. I think those two um, uh, tools in your toolkit will fundamentally reshape um, a lot of the things that we are drilled into from our beginning of our training uh, of being logical, linear, sequential. Um, uh, I, I think both are really important. And so um, do, a, do a six hour course. You don't have to do uh, the whole agile um, uh, methodology course and become agile certified. Uh, I'm, I'm not advocating that at this point in time. You might want to eventually one day when if you're driving technology and you're driving projects and and you know every finance function is in the process of transformation. Transformation is not this one time event. Um, so so one has to become familiar with how to continue to transform systems processes and uh, really execute in this new environment of changing technologies and changing systems. Um, I think these will be really uh, good tools to have in your toolkit. Great, thank you so much. Um, and uh, one of the students wants to know, what are the future generations of accounting and finance professionals role in the bigger conversations on how technology governs and impacts the business model. So when you look at the business model and when you think about on, at the very top, you have the, um, the customer value proposition. Um, and if you look at every example, uh, when, when you think about how uh, businesses have been disrupted, they've basically been disrupted because the way the customer was served changed whether you think of 
you know, Blockbuster to Netflix, so you think of taxis to Uber. It's about delivering the same value proposition, but using technology, using that digital platform. And, and that's what enables you to disrupt. And that, that's what enables you to innovate new ways of serving your customer. So technology has a direct impact and technology is the tool and the enabler to serve your customer differently, to charge your customer in different ways from instead of owning an asset to a platform as use, uh, to, to pay as you use and, and providing a platform for usage. Um, so without technology, you can't actually innovate your customer value proposition and, and new ways of serving the customer, whether it's invoicing them or whether it's actually giving them a new product or, or serving them differently. Um, so technology is absolutely fundamental to that. Great, thank you very much. Um, one of the students is um, inquiring about the fact that you mentioned communication skills, that in certain disciplines in school and in the profession, technical skills are such the hype. And um, hearing that um, communication skills are so important, um, they would like to know if you, if you can give advice on how business leaders can um, basically build that into their uh, staff development and how students now can kind of practice that uh, at an early stage if they're not I, working yet? Sure. I, I think, um, you know, business schools such as yours and universities are already addressing those. I, I think they've already seen the gap. Um, and, and like I said before, communication is not a new skill, um, but the imperative to is, is heightened. Because as, as you automate the information and the insight pieces, um, communicating that effectively and really being able to influence is, is what is going to be the, the skill set of the future finance professional. Um, so, um, you know, things that you do in terms of participation, presenting business cases, um, engaging in debates um, and, and really um, developing the, the power of reasoning and the power of um, influence using logical um, thought processes and uh, being able to intelligently assimilate, uh, collate and, and, and be able to present an argument, um, have uh, emotional intelligence around how to uh, give difficult messages um, and, and how to win people over with um, not just you know, beating them up on the head and using the stick, but you know, how do you, uh, how do you use different methodologies to, um, to, to win the hearts and minds? And it, it's not just about the brains. Having that understanding is, is absolutely critical. And these are skills that are firstly difficult to teach. They're even more difficult to examine. And, and so often what we end up doing is we don't include them in our curriculum because we don't know how to examine them. But as, as we are developing our professional qualification as we go forward, we are thinking more and more about exposing our candidates to areas which won't be examined, but which is compulsory to cover. Um, and so uh, just because we cannot examine something and we cannot uh, score someone's uh, collaboration or communication, or influence doesn't mean we don't start to include materials that actually address these areas. So one of the things uh, business schools and us, we need to be thinking about is exposing concepts of uh, communication, collaboration, emotional intelligence in our courses, and, and we don't necessarily have to examine them. Um, and, and so that's something that we're looking at um, in our um, chartered global management accounting qualification to have um, areas that are like effective collaboration, um, influencing decision-making, uh, negotiating, et cetera, to be included in our curriculum, even though we might not actually examine and score it. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I have another really good question here. Um, how are agile methodologies and big data used to transform organizations around ESG, 
particularly around climate change and racial justice? R really, really brilliant question, because I think Christopher, who asked this question, actually knows the answer. So the reason I say that, the reason I he say probably that does. Is, is because what we are talking about here is intangible. Mm -hmm. You cannot report on racial justice. You cannot really report on climate change. Yes, there's carbon accounting. And yes, what, what we are looking at with ESG um, is predominantly intangible. And how we measure intangibles is through proxies. And, and we have to find the proxies that, that communicate a, a different currency of value. And, and whether, whether that new currency becomes carbon or whether that currency becomes a DEI measure, these are all intangibles. And to find proxies and to be able to deal with proxies, measure proxies, report proxies and analyze proxies, one needs to be able to handle big data. One needs to be able to interrogate big data to understand these trends and to be able to make them tangible, make the intangible tangible through proxies and through big data analytics. So that's, that's how we deal with ESG. And as we go forward, we will have to find new ways of measuring, reporting and disclosing ESG uh, measures. And, and it's, it's really greenfield. It's, it's a great opportunity for those who can handle big data, those who can find um, uh, relevant data that actually is a proxy for climate or a proxy for DEI or a proxy for um, staff satisfaction, et cetera, uh, and, and, and be able to leverage the, those data sets and be able to report on them and measure them, um, they will be really successful. So. Uh, I suspect the, the I suspect Christopher actually understands that, and 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 so the question may maybe I'm being unfair, but uh, uh, I, I I think we have a very bright question in the question that was asked. He asks good questions in the classroom too. <laughs> um, so you know it's already almost six thirty. And I've been uh, informed that uh, the students are going to need their CBA Advantage slide in, a, in order to get credit for coming to this very awesome presentation today. So I'm going to close here, but I just want to say thank you for all the questions. And I will uh, take all the questions and uh, go through them and ask our wonderful distinguished speaker and follow up with you so that you don't feel left out. So my apologies for not getting through all the questions today. Thank you so much, Ash Noah, for such a wonderful presentation. So informative. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It, it has really been a delight and uh, it's been great to engage with such a lively and uh, engaged audience. Thank you.